So we've been going through a, a, a sh very short series, three weeks of loving God, loving one another, and loving the lost. That's the mission of the church, isn't it? Those three things, those three things is the whole mission of the church, loving God, loving one another, and loving the lost. <coughs> That's why the church exists. So let's, uh, let's set it in the context of scripture. Let's turn to Acts chapter 7, please. Acts chapter 7, we're on page 1100 in the Red Church Bible. Acts chapter 11 in the Red Church Bible. This is Stephen, and he's speaking to a whole bunch of, of, of Pharisees, probably the very, very same people who had the Lord Jesus crucified, sentenced him to death. So, this is just a few weeks after the crucifixion and resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And in verse 51, Stephen's getting very excited as he says, You stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts and ears. You're just like your fathers. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your fathers did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. You who have received the law that was put into effect through angels, but have not obeyed it. When they heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices they all rushed at him, dragging him out of the city and began to stone him. Mean, meanwhile the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep, meaning that he died. And Saul was there giving approval to his death. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church, going from house to house. He dragged off men and women and put them in prison. It's the word of God, and when God, God's word is read, God speaks. I wonder if you have a, a favourite verse of the Bible. Does anybody have a, a favourite verse of the Bible? Anyone? Well, for some people, it might be, might be Numbers chapter 6 verse 24. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you. The Lord be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. That, that's a great encouraging verse to, to memorise and say. That's mine, isn't it? For somebody else it might be Psalm 18 perhaps. The Lord is my rock and my fortress, my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. That's a wonderful verse to hang on to in the, the tough times of life, isn't it? Maybe for somebody else, it may be Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It's a great verse to, to proclaim justification by faith alone. There is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. I have one. I have a favourite verse, and it's in that passage that we've just read. One of my favourite verses in the whole Bible is chapter 8, verse 1. And Saul was there giving approval to Stephen's death. Saul was there giving approval to Stephen's death. What on earth is that all about? Why would anybody choose that as their fa the, one of their favourite verses out of the whole of the Bible? Why would I do that? You know what? It's because the gospel 
works. It's because it tells me that the gospel works. The gospel changes lives. Let me tell you, Stephen has been given this a, a beautiful history throughout all of Acts chapter 7 about God's dealing with his chosen people, the, the Jews. And, and, and it culminated in the arrival of the Lord Jesus. And then he accuses the Jews who are listening, you are the ones who crucified the Lord's Messiah. And so they stone Stephen to death. This is mob rule. This is mob violence. Not a fair trial whatsoever. And they stone him to death there in the streets. And what's Saul of Tarsus doing? He's holding their coats. In other words, saying, go on, guys, give him one from me. He's holding that coat and approving of it. And we go on to read in the next couple of verses that a, a great persecution breaks out in the church. And who's leading the persecution? That man, Saul of Tarsus. He's there, verse 3, Saul began to destroy the church what powerful language Saul began to destroy the church going from house to house he dragged men and women out of their houses and had them thrown into prison his 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 venom and his hatred against the church of Jesus Christ is immense he was trying to destroy the church methodically dragging people out of their houses and having them thrown into prison because they trust Jesus. Such was his enthusiasm that he's, he, 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 he tries so hard to destroy the, the church in Jerusalem, but that's not enough. He wants to go to the neighbouring cities, and so he gets letters of permission so, so to say that he can go off to, to the, the city of Damascus. And while he's on the road to Damascus, the Lord Jesus appears to him, and Saul is converted on his way to destroy the church of Jesus, Saul meets Jesus and becomes instantly becomes a follower of Jesus. The leader of the persecution becomes, in an instant, the leader of the church he was trying to destroy. The gospel works. The gospel works. We know him now as the Apostle Paul. Saul was his Jewish name. Paul was his Roman name. He didn't change his name, as some would say, when he had it when he was converted in a new way of life. Saul was his Jewish name. Paul was his Roman name. And he used his Roman name as he went round the Roman Empire telling people about Jesus. But folks, it's that fabulous story to tell you that the gospel works. The gospel uh, that Jesus Christ came to save sinners, it works. The leader of the opposition became the leader of the church because the gospel works. That's why it, Acts 8, chapter 1, Saul was there trying to destroy the church. is one of my favourites because it tells me that if he can be converted, anybody can. Anybody can be converted. Nobody is too far away from God for his Holy Spirit to reach. Your apathetic family members, your wayward kids, your obstinate boss and your Satan-worshipping neighbours, none of them are too far from the gospel. All of them can be penetrated and broken by the Holy Spirit to become followers of of Jesus Christ the gospel works and that just excites me right down to me toes the gospel works men and women can be saved nobody is too far from Jesus that the Holy Spirit cannot work in their life the Bible is proof that the gospel works history is proof that the gospel works and you and I or proof that the gospel works. So we need to have confidence in this gospel that can save lives and change them.
As I say, for the, the past few weeks we've been considering what is the purpose of the church. And the church exists for three reasons. To love God, to love one another, and to love the lost. And we cannot ignore any of them. If, if you prioritise any one of them or any two of them, then you're, like, you're sitting on a three-legged stool that's going to fall over. You need all of those three legs on your spiritual stool, as it were. Yes, we need to love God, absolutely. We want to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus. We need to grow in the love for one another. But we cannot, we cannot ignore the lost. It's not enough just to come here and have a jolly time. We need to be really energised and focused, putting lots of, of money, time, energy and pray into saving those who are outside the kingdom because the gospel works. So let's have confidence in it. Let's look at uh, three headings this morning. We'll look at evangelism in the UK today. Then we'll look at ind individual evangelism and collective evangelism. What state is the church in today? How are we doing today? Well, I think everybody knows that the church is declining. Everybody knows. Those in church know that the church is declining and those outside know that the church is declining. Right across all denominations, the church is in decline. It seems that we've been committing suicide for the last 150 years. When the church has abandoned the Bible and follow the given culture of the day, then we're bound to decline. With, with proof in these last years when the church is approving what society says uh, about marriage and gender. The church is giving approval to what society says about marriage and gender. And if, if we stop following the Bible, we're on a downward spiral. It's inevitable. The church also thought that it should be progressive and it should carve out a role for itself in with social action and politics. And while those are great things, we cannot spend our time and energy focusing on social action and politics at the expense of telling people that they need to be justified by faith in the Lord Jesus. So there's two major reasons why the church is in decline because we've followed society and we've stopped following the Bible's teaching on conversion. When a ship lets go of, go of its moorings, what happens? It drifts. And so the church is in decline. And just because we in the evangelical wing of the church would say, yeah, but we're following the Bible, we're hanging on to the scriptures. Well, the truth is, in the eyes of the nation and in, and in the eyes of the people in Oakwood, we're an irrelevancy. And so they do not care that a few of us hang on to the scriptures. We're a nation that's shot itself in its spiritual foot. And we're desperately trying to recover and not doing very well. Is there any good news? Is there any good news? Well, yes. Be despite the decline of most of the major denominations... The evangelical wing that stands on the Bible are staying stable. And you know what? If we can stay stable, then we're doing really well in today's society. If we can hang on at 0% at growth, but 0% decline, then we're doing well in today's society. There are a number of evangelical Anglican churches that are growing we would have lots in common with them. There are some evangelical charismatic churches that are growing. There are many black churches that are growing. Praise God for that. Are there conversions happening? That's the real test of growth, isn't it? Are there conversions happen happening? Yes, there are. Where are they? Well, mainly conversions are happening amongst the under 25s. And you know, a massive group are mature Christians' own children, right? Our own children. 
are being converted. Praise God for that. And so we need to keep on praying for them and telling them the gospel. Your own children are, will move into the church in God's mercy in the coming generations. University students are being converted as they, they try and find a way in life as they're becoming young adults then they are being converted. Those who are rich and have got all the toys of this world are frustrated with the toys of this world. So they are looking for something deeper and spiritual and the rich of this nation are being converted and of course the poor who are frustrated with their lot in this world, they are turning to Christ as well and looking for a brighter future. Refugees and immigrants also are being converted. But you know what? For churches that don't have many under 25s, for churches that are not in student areas, <coughs> it's tough. It's really tough. Churches like ours, which are not in a student area, and that was one of the first questions I asked our university lecturer over here. Are we likely to see students here? I remember asking you when I first came, and he said to a place like Oakwood, no way, we'll never see any students living in this community. It's too far from the university, and it's too expensive. So we're not going to see students here. For students, for, for, sorry, for, for churches who are outside the student community, we are likely to see less than 1% of conversion. John Stevens, the National Director of the FIEC, published this new book called Knowing Our Times. I gave a copy to all of the elders, I gave a copy to all of the wider leadership team, and in every copy there was one sentence that was highlighted on page 42, because I really wanted everybody to grab hold of it. I show you this sentence, ladies and gentlemen. It is, John Stevens said, the most hardened communities are those who are predominantly white, moderately affluent, who are aspirant, they are the hardest to reach. Ladies and gentlemen, does that make you think of a, of a certain housing estate not a million miles from here? It describes Oakwood to a T, doesn't it? It describes Oakwood to a T. The a state where we are is the hardest to reach in the whole of the UK. Remember, this is under my section, this is the good news. We are living in the, the hardest community that, the hardest community in the UK to reach. The most hardened communities are those that are predominantly white, moderately affluent, who are aspirant. They are the hardest to reach, and that is our community where we live. So, yes, it's been tough for the whole life of this church. It's going to continue to be tough. The people in Oakwood are likely to be politely disinterested in the gospel, though there are occasions when they may be interested such as bereavement, childbirth, moving house, relationship, breakdown and retirement. Whenever people go through a massive change in their, their personal life, they are open to the gospel. They're more open to the gospel. But the truth is, there is no silver bullet. There is no one thing that we need to do that's going to see the masses flocking in. Instead, we need to be faithful in preaching, we need to have confidence in the gospel and we need to be obedient to the scriptures. We need to understand that standing still is going to be hard work, such as the society we live in. Moving on to individual evangelism. Individual evangelism, because the Bible tells us that we should all be individually engaged in evangelism and we should be collectively involved in evangelism as well so individually after a day's training 
with Manchester United, the young David Beckham would stay behind on the field after everybody, all the other players, had left and gone into the changing rooms for a shower and get changed and go home. David Beckham would stay on the field and you'd have one of the groundsmen uh, go over to the goal posts, hang a tyre randomly anywhere in that goal mouth it, on a piece of rope. So it might be over the left side one day, it might be in the centre it, next day, it might be over to the right, it might be high up in a corner, it might be low down in the centre of the goal, goal posts. So this groundman would fix a, a tyre suspended by a rope at random positions for David Beckham after everybody else had left. And Beckham set himself the challenge of putting the ball through that tyre ten times in a row and he wouldn't go back until he was done that. Day after day, ten times in a row, he had to put that ball through the tyre. You know why? It's called practicing to be spontaneous. He was practicing to be spontaneous. Spontaneous, if you just make it up on the spot, doesn't work. Beckham practiced so that in the big game, then he would be able to score. He'd be able to choose his spot, picture the tire and put the ball exactly there. He practiced to be spontaneous in the game on at the weekend. And that's what we need to do. We need to practice to be spontaneous. If Beckham can do it just for a football, we need to practice to be spontaneous with the gospel. 1 Peter chapter 3 so 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 15 says, In your heart set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give for the reason, for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and with respect. This isn't optional. This is for all of us. We all have to be prepared to give an answer. There it is. We all have to be prepared to give an answer for the hope that we have. But if you expect just to make it up on the spot, you know what happens, you're gonna fluff it. So you need to prepare in advance so that you can be spontaneous when somebody does ask you. The thing is though, the thing is, that verse says if you put in your hearts, if you've set apart Christ as your Lord, if you really understand that Christ is your Lord, this won't be a problem. It won't be a big deal. It'll be a joy for you. The thing is, though, you don't have to be a great theologian for this. People nearly always ask the same three questions. And those questions that most people ask are, how do you know there's a God? You can't trust the Bible. And yeah, I know Jesus was a great teacher and a moral example, but... Come on, you can't really believe that he's God, can you? Those are the main three questions that people ask. Now, how could you get answers for these questions? Perhaps you could check out last term sermon series. They're all online. They're all on our YouTube channel. Check them out. Do some homework. Make some notes on the back of a postcard. Just short answers, but prepare to be spontaneous. Also, there are a number of books such as If You Could Ask God a Question by the, the nice people who uh, published Christianity Explored, Rigo Tyson, Barry Cooper. And get one of their books and go through them. You, we have to do some homework. We have to be prepared to give an answer. But before you get prepared to answer these questions, you have to be absolutely convinced that men and women are eternally doomed. Let those words sink in. You have to be convinced that men and women are eternally doomed without Jesus Christ. That should motivate you to do some homework and overcome, 
help you overcome any fears you might have. Do some homework and it is so much easier. Prepare to be spontaneous. Two more things that regularly come up. Two more things that regularly come up and they are, yeah, but I'm not religious. Or, have you always gone to church? They say, struggling to find something of interest. Do you know what those two statements do? They give you the opportunity to tell your story. They give you the opportunity to tell your story about how you came to Christ and what a difference he's made in your life. And the rules that, when, the, the rules that you follow when you, you want to tell somebody your story are keep it short, keep it centred on Jesus, not on you, and watch that body language. Okay? Keep it short, keep it centred on Jesus, and watch their body language. If they start by looking you in the eye, you've got their attention, but if they start looking over your shoulder, then that says they're not listening anymore. So stop and change the conversation. If while you're talking them, their arms fold. Well, you know, you know that's a sign of being on the defence, don't you? So change the subject. If they're not listening, then all you're doing is Bible bashing. And that, 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 that's a dreadful thing, folks. Okay? So when you have the opportunity to tell your story, keep it short, keep it centred on Jesus, and watch their body language. Instead of just chatting about the weather or the football after the service, why don't you practice on one another? Over coffee, why don't you practice on one another? Well, here's one that a mate of mine tried. He went to work and said to one of his trusted colleagues, he said, listen, Bill, we're doing this thing at church about telling your story, but I haven't had the chance to tell anybody and I don't want to, to, to fluff my story. Can I practice on you, please? A mate of mine did that. Try it. Take a risk for the gospel. Take a risk for the gospel and ask if you can tell your story. Can I practice on you? Be bold. Be bold for the gospel. But we know that the most effective way of telling people about Jesus is we need to build good, honest relationships who are like you. People who are similar age and class and colour and interest. Go for people like you. They're the easiest to tell. From my own experience, you know, I'm a middle-aged bloke who's active in the local musicians community. Do you know who I've talked to most about the gospel? Middle-aged musicians. Because they're just like me. We can talk about Led Zeppelin. We can talk about Robin Ford. You must check him out. He's fabulous. We can talk about, about the intricacies of guitar strings and, and have a wonderful time. And then they say things like, have you always gone to church? Or, or you don't sound local. Why are you in Derby? Well, that's a marvellous open door for me to say, well, I came because of my job. Most people move for their job, don't they? I'm in Derby because of my job. Really, what's that? Open door, isn't it? Do you, know how many, do you know how many flower arrangers I've shared the gospel with? Zero. You know why? It's obvious, isn't it? Because they're nothing like me. Flower arrangers, forgive the stereotype, and flower arrangers tend to be female and interested in flowers. And I'm neither of those things. So I've shared the gospel with no flower arrangers at all. If you're a young mum, go and build relationships with other young mums at the school gate and invite them. Hey, do you want to come back for a coffee and see where it leads? Some friends of mine in Newcastle did that. A few Christian mums together with Wednesday morning. We're, 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 we're going back to Sarah's house for, for coffee and bacon sandwiches. Do you fancy coming? Out of that group, Christianity Explored course. Okay? People like yourselves. If you're passionate about more motorbikes, join a bike as club. Don't just ride by yourself. Join a bike as club. If you're passionate about painting, join an art class. If you're passionate about embroidery or archery or badminton or chess, 
go and join one of them clubs specifically so that you can build relationships. Some friends of mine went to night school to, le to learn the Welsh language. You know Welsh is the language of heaven, don't you? It takes an eternity to learn and it's no earthly use. So they, they went to night school specifically to learn Welsh and build relationships and at the end of that term they had three or four people from the Welsh class at their carol service hearing about Jesus. I'm not asking you to go somewhere that you'd hate. I'm never going to apply to join an embroidery class because I'd hate it and they'd hate having me there. I want to I want to go and join a group that that's fun for me. So and then I'll get gospel opportunities. You go and join a group that's fun for you. And look for opportunities to share the gospel. In your workplace, you've got people like you. Next door to you, you've got people like you. We have to have a connection with these people. Build relationships and see what the Lord will do. See what the Lord will do. Collective evangelism. Very important. Evangelism is an individual thing, but it has to be a collective thing as well. It's a team sport. According to, to Rico Tice in his great book, Effective Evangelism, he said there are four levels of inviting people to hear about Jesus. They are, the first one, social events with no gospel at all. And this is why the, the, the guys have just organised a, a curry night and then we're going to watch a, a film about motorbikes. No gospel. Does that sound intimidating to ask a mate along to, to, to that? Not at all. It's as easy as it comes. Curry, motorbikes, fantastic. There should be every bloke that we know flocking to this one. We should, that kind of event should have hundreds there. It's so, so easy. How, how easy is it to, just to say in a, in a couple of months, next April, we're, we're going 10 pin bowling. No gospel content, but it's building relationships with the church, and that's really important. These are very legitimate ways of starting evangelism, and we need plenty of opportunities. The Easter cafes and the Christmas cafes are more examples, actually, of level one, because they don't really have a, a, a gospel content. They're relational building. And so we need plenty of these things happening. People are suspicious of mainstream Christianity nowadays. So we need to put ourselves on display so we can see that we're relatively normal and relatively pleasant. The second level is a social thing with, with gospel content. And so this is what the, the men's and now the new ladies' breakfasts are doing. It's social time where we're Smashing time, chatting around the table about motorbikes and guitar strings, if the right people are there. And then we have a speaker who's going to say something about the gospel. Great ways, great ways of introducing people gently to the gospel. The third level is inviting people on a Christianity explored where they can gently uh, ask questions about Jesus. And the fourth level is coming along to church. It does sound strange that we should be progressing through the other stages, one, two, and three, first, but this is the society that we live in. We need to be in for the long haul. Unless it's something like an all-age service or a, a carol service, which are specifically designed for people to come who are not part of the church family yet. These are things that we can do as a church level. But folks will have to be active. Remember, Jesus' name means I've come to save sinners. It was so important that sinners are saved, Jesus left heaven. And his usual way of spreading the gospel is through you and I. We have to love the lost because Jesus loves them and paid the ultimate price for them on the cross. Let's do what we can. Tell people about Jesus by ourselves and collectively as a family. It starts with prayer. Evangelism starts with prayer because we can't do it by ourselves. We need the Holy Spirit's help. Pray 
that he would give you opportunities. Pray that every day. Because if you don't ask, you don't get. The book of James says that. Unless we ask for certain things in prayer, we're not going to get them. Ask for gospel opportunities and see what the Holy Spirit will do. Take every opportunity of inviting people in to things that are happening at church because the gospel works. The gospel works. The good news that Jesus Christ died to save sinners and he's bring to bring them to Almighty God. The power of the Holy Spirit is as effective today as it was 3,000 years ago on the day of Pentecost when 3,000 were saved. The key thing is don't say no for people. I'd really like to invite them to the ladies' breakfast, but I don't think they'll come, so I'm going to say no, because I know they'll not come. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't say no for the people you want to invite. The gospel works, folks. Jesus came to save sinners, and his usual way is through you and I. So we need to be actively involved individually and collectively recognizing that in this day and age it's tough but let's keep on doing it it'll be for your good their eternal joy and the glory of lord jesus it's a win-win-win situation isn't it let's stand up and rise to action for the glory of jesus